Today's scripture reading is taken from Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 35. Verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he, sh until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. I now call upon Reverend Ashok Amarasingam to bring us God's message for today. Very good, very good morning to all of you gathered here. It's good to see all of you here. Let's come to the Lord in prayer today. And so, Lord, even as we come before you, we want to pray that you grant us uh, understanding uh, to the preaching of your word this morning. And most of all, Lord, um, give us your strength to carry out your word in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, Amen. I've come to preach here uh, quite regularly, at least uh, maybe once a year. And um, in case you do not know me, which I cannot assume that everybody knows me, uh, my name is Ashok Amarasingam. I've been introduced just now. Uh, my dad, who passed away about 23 years ago, he used to be a part-time pastor in this church, just for a very short period of time, uh, Mr. Amara Singham. And uh, my mom and sister used to worship in this church as well. Uh, my sister has since uh, married and moved over to Australia. Uh, my mom is with me. Now she's got uh, Alzheimer's, uh, quite uh, serious. Uh, she just celebrated her 89th birthday a few weeks ago, okay? So we thank the Lord for um, my mum. We call her mummy, okay? Now, we'll look at the slides for today, okay? Forgiving from the heart uh, based on the scripture passage that was read to us. Forgiveness, perennial topic, always applicable whether it be during the days of Jesus or today. You read in the newspapers, uh, people who have been hurt badly, maybe the family member uh, was killed or involved in an accident where somebody else was negligent, 
and you hear the person say, I will never forgive uh, the person who caused the death of my relative. Now, forgiveness is often preached, but all is useless until we practice what we preach. And in the Bible, it says to forgive others from the heart. I've been a pastor for more than 30 years now, and uh, I must say this, that the pastor and the leaders must first model forgiveness in the church, in the family, in society. When love and forgiveness flow freely in the church, then only we can move on in kingdom building work. In my experiences as a pastor, I can recall uh, two uh, incidents that took place. Uh, the first one uh, re relates to one of my churches where um, one of the leaders, they, that person treated me not very well. Okay, and I was very upset with that leader. And um, there was a time where the leader actually left the church. And in my heart, I was so happy that the leader <laughs> left the church. But lo and behold, about nine months later, the leader came back to the church. And uh, he expected me to embrace him and accept him warmly. But as a young pastor that time, I gave him the cold shoulder. And I wanted him to feel that kind of uh, treatment that he gave me earlier. The other leaders of the church noticed this. They came and talked to me about this. Now, I do regret my action. That's not uh, at all what a pastor should be doing. Case number two, I had moved on from one church to another church. And there's a group of people in the first church that actually um, used to irritate me quite a lot, okay? Especially during the church board meeting. And uh, they'll bring up all kinds of issues that are quite divisive. Anyway, I left the church. But about a year and a half later, I was invited for somebody's wedding in the church. Uh, the church members child was getting married and so as I was going to the restaurant okay and I was reversing my car lo and behold I see these two or three people who gave me a lot of trouble during the church board meeting rushing up to my car even before I can reverse my car properly and stop the engine and they were there outside and immediately when I got out of the car they put out their hand and said pastor so nice to see you Okay, at that time, I thanked the Lord that I also put out my hand and said, so nice to see you. Okay, and one thing I realized for pastors who move from one church to another church, you know, sometimes when we are finished in one church, um, you know, we, we close the chapter, you know, and we move on to a new setting. And whatever bad experiences we have, people do not hold it uh, against us or against each other. And I think that's an important lesson we need to learn in life. Today, the focus is very simple. We must forgive others from the heart, period. That's it. Nothing further to say, uh, because this is directly from the Bible. Now, it's interesting in the passage that was read to us. The story begins with Peter's question, but ends with Jesus' word, to all of us on forgiveness. There is a context to, this par uh, to the parables of Jesus, and not only this parable, but other stories of Jesus. And here Peter asks Jesus, if it, is okay, if it is okay to forgive up to seven times. Now it's interesting, in verse 22, the word you, Y-O-U, in English, it can mean either singular or plural, okay? But in New Testament Greek, in other languages, there are different words to describe whether it's singular or plural. In verse 22, uh, when Jesus replied to Peter, it is in the singular. But right at the end of the story, when Jesus teaches everyone, the word is in the plural. So we take note of this. 
Secondly, according to the rabbinic tradition, uh, uh, the Jewish teachers in that tradition, um, they actually say if you forgive someone three to four times, is good enough. So here Peter is actually being generous. He actually asks seven times. Now some of you know my wife, okay? And uh, one thing the preacher must always be very careful, don't say too many things about the wife from the pulpit. But my wife knows that how I operate is that if you say sorry once, is good enough, okay? To me, I always uh, accept things at face value. But for her, sometimes she feels that she needs to tell me sorry a few times over. Maybe like rabbinic tradition or like Peter. So I tell her always, you just tell me one sorry, I forgive you, good enough, okay? Not seven times, not 70 times seven or seven times. Okay, good enough. No need to repeat and say you're sorry. Okay, that's how I operate, quite straightforward. Now, Jesus' reply to this man was uh, 70 times 7, or in some translations, 77 times, uh, depending on how you translate the New Testament Greek. Now, again, it is not so much 490 times or 77 times, but what is really important is that the number 7 is a complete number in Scripture. Okay, So we know that God created the heavens and the earth and human beings, and he rested on the seven days. So in seven days, God created everything and rested. And that is a perfect number. In today's society, we also have numbers. I remember when I was young, growing up, I used to read uh, Bino, Dandy, Topper. How many of you know these uh, comic books? Put up your hands. Uh, some of you, these are all my age people or older. <laughs> The young people, I think you don't know what I'm talking about at all, okay? So those days, I read the comic books. What is the uh, taboo number, pantang number? Number 13, okay? Number 13 is the taboo number. But not in our Malaysian society, you know? I remember visiting a church member in hospital, and the room is number 13A. 13, okay, you know, can put the word 13, okay, but must put an A. Because the taboo number is 14, not 13, okay? My former address in Klang is 172A. It's actually 174, but I cannot put 4 there. So I have to put 172A, okay? So basically what Jesus is saying is to forgive always. But then we can ask the question, if Jesus gave a short and sweet answer, then why bother to give a long-winded story and tell us this parable? Some of you know that pastors can be very long-winded at the pulpit, correct or not? Yeah? Okay, so I also got to be careful today about my time. So why? Why so chiong here? You know? Why like this? And the answer is because there's power in stories and all of us know not just children but we all know as adults we love to listen to stories in luke chapter 15 there are three stories anyone can tell me what the three stories are the lost sheep the lost coin and the lost son and are they all very similar of course lost la, that is a similar word okay are the stories uh, all saying the same thing? Not really. First two stories say the person goes out to look for the animal or for the item that is lost. In the third story, the father stays at home and waits for the son to come back. But what then again is a similarity of all the three stories? The similarity is when someone or something or some animal is lost and is found, there must be rejoicing. And that is why in the third story, when the elder brother refused to rejoice, there's something wrong. And dear friends, as well, when we see people turning to the Lord, there must be rejoicing in the church, in the community. And if we do not rejoice, there is something wrong. 
And that's the message that Jesus is telling us. So coming back to forgiveness, forgiveness, unforgiveness, still very relevant today. And why is this so? Very simple answer. The ego is very big. Ego is very big. And the heart is very rotten. Ego is very big and the heart is very rotten. You know, from my experiences, in every church, there will be cases of church member who was not faithful to the spouse. It can be either way, uh, either man or the woman. Why? Uh? Why we make our marriage vows in church? And then why can we be unfaithful? Again, because the ego is very big and the heart is very rotten. And so the importance of hearing God's word, every sermon that we hear, every time we do our quiet time, every time we are in the car going to work, we are listening to God's word on the audio. It is allowing the Holy Spirit to massage the truth of God's word in our lives. Now those of you who like cooking, you know that uh, meat, you have to marinate the meat and some of you actually physically massage the meat, okay, in the marinade. You massage, you massage, you understand this illustration. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to massage the truth of God's word into our hearts. Now, there's nothing wrong, as we see this story, to beg for mercy and forgiveness. It's interesting that the wording in verse 25 and 29, uh, the uh, first servant, the second servant begging for mercy, okay, is almost identical if you look at the two verses. And I wonder in to today's uh, context, when, when, when people owe you money and they come back to you and say, you know, can you give me more time to pay up my debt? There's nothing wrong for a person to beg for mercy. There's nothing wrong to cancel debts. Now, some terms that are not quite common, and I was hearing the scripture reading today, because other translations have other words like bag of gold, for example. Now, the first servant owed the master an incalculable debt. Case one, servant one, 10,000 talents. What is 10,000 talents? Now, the word um, 10,000 is actually the largest unit of measure, uh, according to the Greek language. It's the largest monetary unit in New Testament Greek. And uh, the word talent is the word murion, and the digit, uh, 10,000, is actually also the largest digit or numeral in the Greek language. So, based on today's calculations, okay, uh, one talent is 6,000 days wages of a laborer. 6,000 days wages, okay. So, 10,000 talents is a huge, huge number. Now, I tried to do some calculation on my smartphone, uh, and when I did all the multiplication, it came out error because my smartphone does not have enough digits there. So let's say 50 ringgit, a uh, very conservative figure. A laborer gets today 50 ringgit for the work, hard, hard day's work, times 6,000 days, times 10,000 talents. If my calculation is correct, it is 3 billion ringgit, okay, in today's terms, 3 billion ringgit. And the man asked the king, please give me more time to pay back this debt. Now, in a pagan society, the king can demand the man to sell his wife, his children, and his possessions because that debt actually cannot be paid. It's so big. Case number two, okay, 
uh, is only a hundred denarii, and a denarii is uh, one day's wages. So fifty ringgit times uh, one hundred is five thousand ringgit. One is three billion ringgit. I, I can't imagine how big is three billion. I read in the newspaper people stole from Malaysia so many billion. I I can't fathom that kind of amount. Okay, this one five thousand ringgit I can understand. Okay, is is more more something that we are used to, that kind of figure. And so the king or the master had actually pity on the first servant and cancelled that humongous debt freely. What mercy and what love. You know, the servant, number one, did not ask for the debt to be cancelled. All he asked is, give me more time. But the master realised that however much time he has, he cannot pay that debt. So the Bible says that the master took pity upon him. He was moved with compassion and forgave him completely. Zero debt. I wonder how many of you have been in debt before. No need to put up your hands, okay? If you have been in debt before, you will understand what it means for somebody to cancel your debt. And you, you will be so grateful to that person. And that's how much God loves us. God has forgiven us all our debts. He did what was impossible. We could not pay back our debts. He sent his son to die for our sin. There's a modern song that goes like this. I'm not sure if you sing it in church. Where would I run but to your throne of mercy? Where would I kneel but at this cross of grace? How great the love how strong the hand that holds me. Beautiful, so beautiful. So here I bow to lift you high. Jesus, be glorified in all things for all my life. I am yours, forever yours. Now we find the story taking a twist because a second servant owes the first servant this, what I say, 5,000 ringgit. Note that the fellow servants had big eyes to injustice and a big mouth, okay, to speak up to the relevant authority. Now, my experiences in church is sometimes we got big mouth, huh? but it's not against injustice. It's all the juicy news that happens in church, huh? our big mouth to gossip with others. Okay? But the servants here, they spoke up to the master. Okay? And it's interesting that uh, they realized that there was something wrong. Now, every time I go to a new church, I have new experiences. When I was three years in KL Wesley, I'm associate pastor. I realized as associate pastor, the leaders don't come and talk to you. They only say hi, goodbye, bye-bye to you. Ordinary church member, yes, come and talk. The leaders all go and talk to the number one pastor in charge. So in a sense, I felt a little bit redundant there for three years, okay? But I can make my own network of friends, etc. This year, I am the one and only pastor in Emmanuel Methodist Church. Okay, I think you, you get the double meaning here. Huh? Only one pastor, lah, okay? So everything or so people come and share with me, ordinary church member, church leader, etc. And one thing I realize is that ordinary church members and church leaders like to come and tell me stories of things that happened in the past, in yesteryears, regarding some people and some leaders of the church. One lesson I realize is that don't believe everyone on the first go, okay? The story may be exaggerated, they may have got facts wrong, but if there are more people that uh, say the same thing, then there's something behind it. But I realized that problems that took place in the church long, long time ago is none of my business. I'm the current pastor here, but it is my business if the same problem recurs when I'm the pastor. I also realized that people are quite perceptive so I hear the stories, and then I'm trying to listen carefully. Was there an injustice? Was there something wrong that was done? 
And in most cases, there's something wrong that happened. And so I can say that, that people are perceptive, they can see injustice that is taking place. And in some cases, they report it to the relevant authority. How can a small debt be treated so cruelly? And that's why the fellow servants went and reported it to the master. When someone has been shown big time mercy. Now, correctly, the cultural expectation is if you have been shown big time mercy, you better show mercy to others as well. How many of you follow social media? Put up your hands. I expect more people here to be putting up their hands. Huh? Social media, do you all follow social media? And quite often in social media, people pick up injustice. Okay? And, and, and so I think that's good in a sense, so that people get to think, okay, is this really injustice or is this really your perception? And the more people highlight injustice, the better it is. But in social media, people also picked up acts of kindness. How many of you have seen acts of kindness uh, either in TikTok or other social media, media and shared with others? Have you seen that, acts of kindness? Yes. And I think that is also wonderful. Correctly, the distressed fellow servants reported the matter to the right authority, as I mentioned. And correctly, the master acted in righteous anger and reversed mercy to judgment. And so now the focus is on the master. Note that at the start of the parable, the word is used king. Now the word that is used is master. And in his righteous anger, he reversed the judgment. Those of us who are soccer fans like Pastor Robert and myself, we know that in today's world, for example, Premier League and his team is now top on the league and my team is chasing after his team, Arsenal. Um, there is this thing called video referral. How many of you have heard of video referral? Okay. Today's video referral, even yesterday, Arsenal scored one goal. We have to wait two minutes to see whether it's offside or not. Okay. Now, a decision can be overturned, reversed, because of all the fine lines that are used by technology. But here we find that the, the master reversed his judgment and he called the first servant, you wicked and evil servant. In some parallel stories, we find that the jailers are actually the torturers. And this word torturer is a word that is equivalent to the tortures of hell. And he delivered the servant to the torturers. I was thinking of a good 21st century equivalent. And in pastoral ministry, you get to learn of a number of cases. And young people do listen to this one. Okay? It may not be applicable to you today, but maybe in 10 years' time, yes. We have a child, married, perhaps married, perhaps not, usually married with an in-law, son-in-law, daughter-in-law. And then we find that uh, what happened is the parent is an elderly parent, okay? And as a parent grows older, maybe have some mental issues also. So the child goes and talks to the parent. Um, Mommy, Daddy, you know you're getting older now. Uh, maybe you can't even handle your own bank account or your accounts. You know you have this house, okay? Why not you transfer the house to me, lah, okay? But don't worry, I will look after you all the days of your life until you pass away one day. And then the poor parent also thinking, La, I may get dementia, all that, I can't handle my money. Uh, okay, okay, transfer. Transfer the property, maybe one property or two properties to the name of the child. 
And then the child together with the spouse, okay, in-law, rotten heart, rotten heart. So they take the money and then sometimes they tell the parent, sorry, uh, you're on your own. Lah. Maybe after five years, I can't help you anymore. Or go and ask another child to help you or your, your relative to help you. I cannot help you. Do you think that's injustice? It is big time injustice. And dear friends, we may have a good heart, but our spouse may have a rotten heart. And we got to ensure that this kind of scenario does not take place. I remember my own dad, uh, and my sister told me this story. Like he was influenced by his friends around him. And he was quite smart. So when he drew up the wheel, he knew how to draw, draw it up in a certain way that my mother's needs were taken care of fully. Okay? And sometimes as children, we say, wow, you don't trust us, uh, you, you do like that. Uh. But actually, he's quite smart. Okay? You do not know what's going to happen in the future. And so, my dear friends, uh, we need to remember how to protect uh, those who are under our care. Let me just quickly go to some lessons that we can learn on forgiveness. The Bible is brutally honest that since God has forgiven you big time of all your sins through Jesus Christ, forgiving others is not a choice but mandatory. You know, in this passage, Matthew 18, verse 35, we know in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, they are all in sync, perfectly in sync. On the cross, Christ said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And forgiveness must originate from our heart, because that is where the battle really happens. We need to reorganize our priorities in order to win the battle of the heart. And we need to surrender the offenders unto the Lord. You were forgiven big time by Jesus. Let me just show you those verses from Matthew chapter 6. Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The Lord's Prayer. And at the end of the Lord's Prayer, not inside the Lord's Prayer, but the verses to follow, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. So crystal clear. Today, whenever I do a premarital counselling, I want to put in something for the couples to think about. And usually when they see me, um, I ask them a lot of questions. Then I slip in this one question. I said, I, do, I, I never hope this to happen to your uh, marriage in the future. But if ever you discover that your spouse is unfaithful to you, involved in a third party, what will you do? It's interesting, the reaction, you know. Suddenly, they're looking at me. They look at each other with daggers in their eyes. I don't think they've ever thought about this question before. And then some of the responses, particularly the girls, huh, they say, I'm going to see the divorce lawyer straight away. Some others say, only one chance. Second chance, I'll go and see the divorce lawyer. Never mind, let them all share. The purpose of the counsellor is to make them communicate with one another. Then all like quieten down a little bit. Then I slip in la, my advice. I said, do you know that your sins have been forgiven by Jesus? Oh yes, of course, of course, we are Christians, okay? Assuming that both parties are Christians. 
And do you know that we still um, hurt the Lord by sinning against Him? And every time we ask Him for forgiveness, He'll forgive us. Oh, yes, yes, uh, we know this. Then don't you think that you too need to forgive your spouse? Then is dead silence in the room. Now, I don't want to minimize all this thing about uh, extramarital affair or relationships. But all I want to say is that if God has forgiven us big time, then we also have to think in this line. I've known of cases where, yes, they will go for counseling, they go for accountability, so that until that uh, extramarital relationship is broken, uh, then only they can build again on their marital relationship. I know of one family where this happened and with the help of the counsellor, uh, the counsellor told the man who was unfaithful, he said, you cannot stay in the same room as your wife until you have settled this and you'll be treated like a guest in your house. And that's how seriously we take the word of the Lord. But we may object by saying, uh, God cannot force me to forgive others because my feelings are so hurt and so damaged. I have no energy anymore to forgive the offender. God, you must be joking. I think there's something wrong in the Lord's prayer. I have no energy to forgive anymore. Husbands and wives here, how many times you have forgiven each other in your marriage for minor offences? Plenty of times, manifold times. And there's always a joke when we say, uh, husbands, to have a successful marriage, you only need to know two phrases. Yes, my dear, you are right, my dear. If you say these two phrases, always you'll have a very successful marriage. Yes, we agree that we are not uh, robots. We cannot program ourselves to say that we forgive somebody. But God has commanded us to forgive others once we have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. And we must obey God, period. And that is why I believe so strongly in Christian marriage. Because in Christian marriage, the man and the woman, as they prepare to get married, and finally on the day of their wedding, they make vows before God. And then they are accountable to God for one another. Because they say that the Bible has authority in my life. And dear friends, if one party has not turned to Jesus and trusted in the Bible completely, and if that person is unfaithful and they come to me, all I can say is, you know, you said you love your wife. What are you doing now? But if both parties are Christians, I can say you're under the authority of God's word. Now is the time to repent to God and to your spouse and come back under the authority of the word of God. So we sing the song, I've decided to follow Jesus. You know, the, the new version, so beautiful, the tune and the extra words, no turning back, no turning back. But now there's a big problem in my mind. I believe in the scripture. I believe in God's word. My heart finds it so difficult to obey God's word. My mind and my heart are not in sync. I'm not a robot. You cannot force me to do like this. So what's the solution? The solution is Jesus. Jesus knows that we are weak, and that's why he assures us, take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So the best ointment that we can use for our hurt feelings is the ointment that Jesus gives us. We all know the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And in uh, one part of the song, it says, Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. 
Now let me just qualify what forgiveness does not mean. It does not mean yielding and condoning to the violent and abusive behavior of the offender. Now, you know, people send me all sorts of video clips. Uh, TikTok now, a lot of TikTok video clips people send to me. And uh, some in the past, they send me assassination, okay? Uh, firing squad people getting shot and killed on the spot. I say, please, uh, next time don't send to me like this, lah, okay? Uh, but there's one that I received recently. And I assume, I don't know, assume that the man, the aggressor is a father and the nine-year-old girl is a daughter, I'm assuming, lah, okay? And the father is repeatedly punching and slapping the daughter. And when the daughter is on the floor, kicking the daughter in the guts. And the daughter is begging for mercy. Now, this kind of case is police case, you know. If we know this, go and make police report. Because it is abuse. Whether father or uncle or relative is abuse of the child. Okay? So... In that context, uh, police must step in. It doesn't mean that the damaged relationships are instantaneously restored. And we all know, even in the area of husband-wife relationship, uh, third party, extramarital affair, etc., cannot just simply say sorry like that. Yes, can simply say sorry, but it takes time to build that relationship again. You know, most ladies I ask, I say, is it very difficult if one day, you know, your husband cheats on you and you forgive the person and restore? He said, yes, it's very, very difficult for a woman. I think for a woman, it's more difficult than for a man. You know why? Because men know that this area of weakness is a very real area in our lives. So it's like a house of cards is knocked down. You think instantaneously it can come up? No, slowly you got to put cart by cart to build that house and indeed to effect that kind of forgiveness. Forgiving others must come from the heart. Turning to God at once and telling God honestly that you will forgive the offender because God has forgiven you bountifully in Christ. And then how to restore the relationship. We can do acts of kindness, of love to the offender. After saying to that person, I have forgiven you. The Bible reminds us in Ephesians 4.32, one of my favorite verses in the New Testament, be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Finally, my dear friends, the church has to be the place where repentance and forgiveness flows freely and God's love radiates to all of us. Maybe the church cannot do very big projects Maybe the church is not like the church down the road that can effectively reach out to hundreds of people. But if the church is a safe place where repentance and forgiveness flows freely, and the people in church practice what it means to love and forgive others, then the hallmark of the church is in this area. And then no need to say we only got 100 people, that church there got 1,000 people. Because we are actually uh, being the salt and light of Christ within the community. Let me just, just quickly say this. Monkey see, monkey do. You know what I'm saying? The monkey, the first monkey is the older people in the church. The leaders of the church who are more like my age. The second monkey is the younger people in the church. And so if the older monkeys are practicing love and forgiveness, the younger monkeys will also catch on to this. Monkey do not do, monkey do not see, monkey do not do. Okay, The older monkeys are not doing love and forgiveness. 
the younger monkeys will also not do it as well. So number one, listen to the offences. You know, very hard even for me as a pastor, okay, but I want to do it. If I offended someone, I'll go out to that person and tell the person, I am sorry I offended you. Not with that tone of voice, huh? I'm sorry I offended you. And then you ask that person, will you forgive me? Of course, a person may not want to forgive you immediately, and that, that's fine, okay? Are you going to persist and ask that person for forgiveness? Now, if we are the person who will forgive others, we must forgive others. Any church member who comes and tells me, Pastor, I'm so sorry I did this, instantaneously I'll tell that person, I have forgiven you. Because that is what the Bible tells us. And then we must restore that relationship. Let me end with a video clip. Uh, this is a story of a man called um, George Palmer. In the year 1959, there's a big Billy Graham crusade in Melbourne Cricket Ground. I love Melbourne Cricket Ground because I studied in Melbourne and I go there to watch uh, cricket matches. This is well before my era, well before I was even born, uh, 1959. Huge, massive crusade there. George Palmer and his nine friends, they all pakat, okay? They all agreed with one another, we are going to kill Billy Graham at this crusade, okay? The rest, I will let the video do the talking. So over to the AV team. The 10 of us went to that crusade was to kill Billy Graham. I made up 10 zip guns, so each member had one of those. I said to the guys, come on, we're going on the green. And we spaced ourselves so that we could see each other around where Billy Graham was preaching. We decided that we would leave it until the appeal time. Not before, but during the appeal. We would kill Billy Graham. There are thousands of you here today that have burdens that need to be lifted. My gun was under my jumper. And I'm standing there and I looked around at this crowd and I thought, what the dickens are all these people doing here? And I turned back around and then suddenly a voice said to me, what are you doing here, George? And I quickly turned back around to have a look and see who was there and nobody was there that I knew. And I got very uncomfortable about that, I can tell you. Very uncomfortable. The Spirit of God is speaking and He's here tonight and you know He's here. And there's a little voice down inside of you that says you need Christ. That is God speaking. Okay, I know this is you, God. You took my dad. You hurt me so much. Why should I love you? Why should I care about you? And God said to me, George, I didn't take your dad to hurt you. And indeed, he said, I would never hurt you, full stop. Well, by this time, I'm starting to melt a bit. Now, remember that I hadn't cried since seven and a half. I tell you, before you leave this great stadium, you can find an answer to the dilemmas and mysteries of life. If you will come and surrender yourself without reservation, to Jesus Christ. I thought about it for a while, and then the appeal came. I suddenly began to weep, and I cried, and I cried, and I cried. My zip gun was under my jumper, and I put it on the ground, and I ran to the front. There may be many factors that led you to this moment, but there is a climactic moment when you give your life to Christ. 
Can you do it by faith? Faith in Christ? The amazing thing was that nine out of the ten of us got converted that night. Then we were all a bubbling mess. We really were. And we talked about, you know, how wrong we were and the things we'd done and all this. It was quite a night, let me tell you, quite a night. <laughs> yes, TikTok must appear. <laughs> And so I end my message for today, and let's just bow uh, for the word of prayer at this time. Lord, again, we come before you, Lord. We thank you for the amazing way in which you work in George Palmer and the life of all his gangster friends. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for convicting their hearts that they need to turn to Jesus. Otherwise, Billy Graham would have died in the year 1959. And today, Lord, we may be struggling with issues of forgiveness. And Lord, to know that, that we must do our part to forgive others. Lord, sometimes it's very difficult because the other party does not want to accept the wrongs or does not want to again restore that relationship. But Lord, we just ask that you help us today. Help us, Lord, because we are weak and we need your strength and your power. And above all else, Lord, we thank you for your word that speaks life into our lives. Be with us, Lord, as we continue to worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen.